I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey everybody, on today's show, I get to take a little bit of a departure from some of my hunting and fishing guests, and I get an opportunity to hear a truly inspirational story by a gentleman that I was just lucky enough to to get a little bit of time with. I'm going to read you his bio right now. Dr. Joe Martin is an award-winning international speaker, author, educator, and expert man builder. He's authored or co-authored nine books, including Are You the Man? 201 Lessons I Wish My Dad Would Have Taught Me, The Real Man Spiritual Leader Blueprint, and Gifts and Handkerchiefs, A Lesson in Servant Leadership. Joe has spoken for our more than 750 businesses, organizations, churches, colleges, universities, and K-12 schools, and he was voted National Speaker of the Year by the Association of the Promotion of Campus Activities. He's also the host of Real Men Connect podcast, the number one rated podcast on iTunes for Christian men. Now, he doesn't get all of these speaking engagements accidentally. Joe has a story that really is... um, Unlike any story that I've heard told to me personally, Joe grew up in a place called Liberty City uh, in Miami. And if you're familiar with Miami, you may know Liberty City, or you may know that that's just a place that you want to stay out of. If you're familiar with the video game Grand Theft Auto, that's where this is set in Liberty City. Joe grew up there. He managed to survive. A lot of his friends did not manage to survive there. And he gets out and he makes it before losing everything again. And he calls it a rags to riches to ruin to redemption story. And in his story, there are definitely lessons for all of us. And Joe has figured out how to how to operate now. And he's doing he, he's doing some things that uh, that are really making some big ripples in the world. He has de- decided to devote his life to uh, creating an organization where he can mentor other men that are having the same kind of issues. And the issues are that while he was able to do well in college and, and get out and get a job, then what? Then what happens? Uh, you got money now, you uh, all, all kinds of stuff happens. You see it happening with uh, with NFL draft picks, top draft picks that uh, make all this money and then lose it or do just crazy, stupid things. And Joe points out that that's because they don't know how to be a man to begin with. And that's what he's devoted his life to, is to teaching people how to take care of their responsibilities, how to live as a man in this world and not make these these really stupid choices. I got a lot out of it. I think that you will too. And if, uh, if nothing else, it is a remarkable story of survival. So we're going to get down to this conversation real soon, right after I tell you and read this ad that Waypoint TV is an awesome place to watch hunting and fishing content. You can go there and watch over 2,000 episodes from 60 different producers producing some of the best outdoor content there is. It is available on your smart TV, on Roku, Apple TV. You can watch it on your phone, your tablet, your computer, anytime, anywhere, any device. Watch Waypoint TV. And if you like hunting and fishing content, that's the place. Go to waypointtv.com. Find out how you can get the app on all your different devices and you can watch your favorite shows anytime, anywhere, on any device. So I'd like to introduce you to my new friend, Dr. Joe Martin. So I am sitting here with Dr. Joe Martin, and uh, we have some mutual friends, and I am really, really thankful that you uh, had a few minutes to sit down with me today because you've got an amazing message and an amazing story. I had a few friends that just saw you speak recently. I got two or three texts saying, this is this guy was the best speaker I've ever heard. Wow. And I know these guys hear a lot of speakers at these different lunches, luncheons and other things. So I wanted to see if we could schedule a time to sit down because most of my audience, I would say the large portion of my audience is, uh, is men. And we have some kind of 
mutual, just in the little bit of time that I've uh, spent researching your work, we have some mutual feelings on building a group around you. Mm-hmm. But uh, man, I'd just like to hear your story. You have something called Real Men Connect. Right. And that's my organization. That's your organization. So how does this get started? What, tell me your story because I know, that you, I know that you told your story the other night and it blew my friends away, the whole story. And man, I'd just like to hear it. How did you get here? Well, first of all, Tom, thanks for um, having me on. I, mean, I love sharing my story. I'm not always proud of it, but I realize that a lot of times out of my story, some of the tears I've had to shed has become medicine for other men to listen to. And also found out that when you're open and transparent with other men, they tend to trust you more. And so I'll give you the ESPN version of my story, because I'm sure you can ask me and unpack a lot of stuff that I'll share with you. But the way I summarize it, I can summarize it pretty much in less than 10 seconds. My story is a rags to riches to ruin to redemption. Four steps. Okay. Rags, riches, ruin, redemption. And so I'll touch on each segment. The rags part, I, I grew up in, I heard that you do work down in the Keys. Yeah. But I grew up in Miami. Okay. I'm from Miami, even though I live here in Chattanooga. Grew up in a ghetto in an urban area called Liberty City. Okay. And for those of your listeners out there, if they're not familiar with Liberty City, if they've ever heard of the, the uh, video game Grand Theft Auto, yeah. then they probably heard of Liberty City. Okay. Or for your older guys out there who are about my age, 40 and over, um, if they've ever heard of a rap group called Two Live Crew yeah. <laughs> back in the Two day. Two Live Crew, yeah. Yeah, they're the reason why there's explicit lyric labels mm-hmm. on um, CDs now and mm-hmm. on music. But um, I grew up in that environment and it was a huge environment. You're talking about five high schools, two malls. So I didn't meet a white child until I was 12. Wow. And so my mom was a teenage mother. She had me at the age of 16. Um, and then she had my sister at the age of 17. So by the time she was a junior, in high school, she had two kids wow. and she was one of 12 herself and her mom had passed away when she was 12. So my mom didn't have a lot of motherly guidance and she had a, a, a dad, my grandfather, who was from the islands. So he was very overbearing. The islands? Like yeah. What, the I'm Caribbean from Bahamas, islands? Bahamas, from the Bahamas, okay. yeah. He was um, from Nassau. Mm-hmm. So she thought that having kids will help her be a, her take it out of that, his, I guess, his authority. Right. And so, but my dad, who got her pregnant, um, couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. And they didn't get along well. And he decided that he couldn't be a father anymore. So he left. And so my mom had two kids by herself. Can you imagine being a 17 year old with two children? No. And my mom was very, very smart. So she dropped out of high school though, because she had to take care of these children. Right. But because this wasn't a life that she planned herself, didn't see herself doing this, she became very depressed. Um, especially after my grandfather died. My grandfather died when I was 10 years old. And so now she's lost both parents by the time she's 20, 20, um, I guess the time she had to be 27, 26. So both of her parents are gone. She's in her twenties, no education, two kids, no one there to help her dad. My dad is gone. So she became very depressed and she started drinking and the drinking got so bad that she was drinking up to two six packs a night Wow. and made only thing worse than that. She made me go get the beer for it. She would give me the money, but they wouldn't sell it to an out of store. They sold it out of a house. So this guy. So where's she getting the money to to have she worked, that habit? Okay. She worked um, worked two jobs sometimes, but she she was a very hard worker. But it was she was a functioning alcoholic. She's yeah. the uh, prototypical definition of a functional alcoholic. That she looked like a million bucks when she would go to work, hmm. and she was doing menial jobs. But she, very attractive woman, looked great. But then she would come home, it turned like Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde kind of thing. Wow. And so um, she did drown her misery. She would drink. And when she used to drink, she'd get very, very angry and she became very abusive sometimes, not just verbally, but physically. And so I had this depressed mother. And how old are you at this time? At this time, she was 27. I was, I uh, had to be 10. Okay. But I mean, I had to experience stuff like this before, at least my grandfather was a buffer before, but after he died, she just lost everything. Man. She just felt like her life shouldn't go on. So she cooked her last meal when I was 10. Wow. So when I say cook the last meal, no more preparing food for her kids. So when my grandfather died, it's like she died too, but we were still living. And so there was times I didn't eat, you know, I would starve. And my sister, as we got older, she used to steal food um, to feed us. And she was my younger sister. And so with that going on, and I, my mom was physically abusive as well. Um, I was very depressed, as you can imagine, as a kid. But during that time, that was just in the home. But in my environment, 
Um, I was witnessing all types of violence and crime and just anger from from males. Like your environment, the neighborhood. Oh, yeah, or... man. It, it was horrible. Um, by the time I reached the age of 16, I had buried six of my friends. Wow. And that that's um, violence, yeah, shootings. gang violence. Right. Um, and these the friends I'm talking about, I don't believe not one of them was a criminal. It was just wrong place, wrong time. Right. I mean, sometimes getting off a school bus in middle school, oh. drive-bys. I mean, almost, I would say at least six times a year, they would do drive-bys on our school bus, man. But it, it was crazy. So my, I lived in perpetual fear, thinking that I was going to die as a child. Wow. So when you go to enough funerals and you start seeing your friends die, you got to believe you're next. And people will try to tell me when they ask me, what's wrong with you? And I tell them, I say, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You don't want to hear a kid say that. Right. But when they would tell me, no, I'm not. I said, well, uh, how do you explain my friends dying? What, God just didn't like them or something? Mm-hmm. And they, no one had answers for me. So I couldn't understand how was this happening. And I'm spending too long on the rags part because there's a lot of other stuff. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm just trying to give you some context of yeah. what I was facing. And I had a dozen friends, at least a dozen friends, and now probably two dozen friends who are doing time in prison. I have two um, family members who are doing life sentences. And um, I have a brother who's hopefully getting out. By the time this airs, that he'll be out. Oh, good. Um, he was in for the second time. And so, but growing up, this is what I witnessed watching my mom get held at gunpoint in front of me, being personally shot at because I was around the wrong people at the wrong time. So I always thought I was going to be the next person. Yeah. And to kind of give you a context of how bad it was for me in this, my mindset, when I used to ask kids in our neighborhood, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because we had some great athletes come out of Miami, man. Some make it to the sure. pros. Yeah. And they would ask me, little Joe, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I was a little kid. And I mean, I was usually the smallest kid what yeah. I was running around with. They said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I used to tell them, alive. That was my answer. And I meant it that I just wanted to make it to my 18th birthday. So in addition, and I'm leaving, leaving other stuff out of this, I will tell you this. I remember um, that when I used to go to the bus stop, I didn't meet a white child until I was 12. That's when they integrated this, were integrating the schools and they bused me out of Liberty City to North Miami, okay. which isn't that far away. Yep. But I didn't even know we had South Beach until I went off to college. Wow. But so I used to go to my bus stop and I used to get solicited by prostitutes, and imagine at 14, 15 years you're old, about younger than that, 12, <laughs> yeah, about 12 wow. years old. That's I was in yeah. sixth grade, seventh grade. And imagine some women flashing their bodies in front of you. and You don't understand what's going on. Right. It's very traumatic. And my mom, when I was 12, after she realized that she's can't pull herself together, realized that I need to help my kids, especially little Joe, because he doesn't have any males in his life. So she recruited a family member to help raise me. And to his credit, he took better care of me than my own dad did. And my own mom, he fed me, clothed me. So at that, I mean, she's, she did, was there like a, a moment there where she just said, that can't happen anymore and I got to get some help here? Or was it a slow process to where she well, finally reached out? I couldn't answer that for her. Um, I don't know. As a kid, you're just experiencing it and living right. it. You don't know what's going on. I know a lot of times I question whether or not she loved me, whether or not she loved my sister because no one seemed to care about us. Right. But when she did that, at least showed me she was looking out for me. So she found my cousin who didn't have a criminal record, had a job, had a car because we never owned a car. Mm-hmm. And so to her, he had the qualifications um, to help raise me. And he did take better care of me than my mom. Yeah. He fed me. He clothed me. Um, he did everything for me. But I didn't realize he was prepping me because he sexually abused me as a child for three years. Mm. And that was almost the beginning of the end for me because my life was going bad at that time from 10 to 12. But when he did that, you can imagine how isolated I felt, Man. how ashamed, guilt, fear, all those emotions, and not having a way to process that right. stuff. So I was suicidal from 12 to 16. And eventually he left the house, and that's a whole nother story. But I'm going to get past that. That's the rag sparks. We still got to <laughs> tell you I was going to give you the ESPN version. Now I'm giving you the, I don't know, the 2020 version yeah. of it now. Okay. I was still able, I knew I wanted something different after I did not kill myself at 16. Yeah. I knew that I wanted to do something different. And and this is kind of embarrassing, but I wanted to go to college, Uh not because I was smart, because I barely graduated from high school, 2.2 GPA, but I was at a predominantly white school. No one in our neighborhood was going to college. Nobody, unless even the athletes weren't going to college because they didn't even make it past high school. But when I went to this predominantly white high school, I would go up to some of my friends and ask them what they're doing after high school because I was going to join the military. I figured that would be my way out. Okay. And they would tell me they're going to college, but I'm thinking to myself, they're not even smart. Why are they right. going to college? Yeah. <laughs> and I tell you, this is embarrassing, but I said, the only reason I went to college because I said to myself, okay, I'm dumb and um, they're dumb too. 
but they're dumb and they're going to college. Maybe I'm dumb enough to go to college too. That's, <laughs> that was my thought process. Yeah. So I decided I was dumb enough to go to college just like them. Wow. And so um, I started applying to colleges. I got turned down by at least 30 of them um, because of my SAT scores okay. and didn't have a high GPA. But I got into community college because they'll let anybody pretty much in community college. Yeah. But okay. So at this point, I mean, it's been rough mm-hmm. up to this moment. And, and you've got a 2.2 and probably very low SAT score. Mm-hmm. College has not been on the radar. Mm-mm. But this is just kind of an idea that came into your head like, I want to go and, and all these other people are going. And like you said, I'm just as dumb as they are. So I can, I can go or that's, that was it. And you just kind of got a little more interested and a little more interested and started applying to these colleges Pretty much. You, with, you, with help <laughs> yeah. or because well, I've yeah. seen my kids go through this process and it's not an easy process. No. And if you don't even know where to start, what does that look like? Well, as eventually what I did is I went into our guidance counselor's office okay. and, you know, especially us being poor, it was easy to get financial aid. Yeah. I just need somebody to help me to do the paperwork. Okay. But even they were like, I don't know if you're going to be your college material, but I wanted to at least try it. Yeah. So it didn't take much to, to go ahead and apply for college. Um, it's just whether or not I was going to go. And, and then you're turned down for 30. About 30 of them, at least 30 of them, who told me, you know, they sent me nice letters about I wasn't, you know. Uh-huh. Right now, due to so many great applicants, we can't admit you this year. But it was based on my SAT scores. Yeah. And so where did you end up going? So I ended up going to a, a community college. They even changed the name of now. It was Okaloosa Walton Community College, which okay. is about eight hours away from Miami. So I've never been outside my city. Oh. School was going to be paid for to get me started. My first semester in college. Now I'm getting into the, the richest part. My first semester in college took 17 credits, which is crazy because you shouldn't take that right. many credits as an co- incoming freshman. 4.0. 4.0. 4.0. Never had A's before except in PE. So how does that happen? Because I, I'm very interested in that. Desperation. Yeah. Um, it was, I wish I could say more inspiration, but it was more desperation. Think about it this way. You see what I just left, right? Yeah. I'm in a new environment. First of all, I get into this new environment and I don't hear any sirens. It's in the rule. It's in rural Niceville, Florida, yeah. which is outside of Fort Walton Beach, Florida, if oh, anybody's yeah, familiar with Fort Walton, the, the Emerald Coast. Mm-hmm. And so here I am, there's nothing out there, peace and quiet. And all I know is that I had been there about two weeks and I hadn't been shot at once. And I didn't want to go back home. Well, you don't want to go back home. Does it, but, does, you know, when you get into a situation to where it's just so far out of the norm for you, what does that feel like? I mean, it, is it an immediate comfort? Like, oh, I love this place. Or is it kind of like, man, what's going to happen next? Fear because um, I didn't see a lot of black people. Uh-huh. Um, fear of what if I fail? fear about what's happening to my family while I'm here at college mm-hmm. because I would call my mom on Wednesday nights and I would hear gunshots in the background and she assured me it wasn't at her but it was out in the street wow. but um, I was just talking to someone on the phone the other day and I heard sirens because he's from South Florida too and I could hear the sirens mm-hmm. it kind of took me back to my childhood yeah. and but I used to hear the gunshots so it was fear but what got me to, to get that 4.0 is that I didn't want to go back home a failure and yeah. so I just fought my way through it and I I, I would hardly sleep. I would hardly eat. I, I mean, just but was at this desperate. time, at this time, you you didn't you did poorly in high school. You haven't developed the the study habits. You, no. you, I wasn't a bad student. It's just that I didn't. I, I let I let the fear of my environment at that time stop me from doing my best in school because yeah. my mind wasn't in school. I was thinking about okay, is this guy gonna molest me when I go home tonight? Right. Uh, is my mom gonna be dead when I get home because? She would be passed out sometimes when I come home. What am I going to eat tonight? So my mind is not in school. I'm not focused on school. Now that my, those immediate needs were not an issue anymore right. as I go off to college, I could focus now on everything. just everything on doing what I can do to succeed in college. Nice. You know, and that worked. And that helped. And, but, uh, but I never worked so hard in my life that first semester in college. Wow. But then I ended up graduating early. Well, not early from that college, but I graduated and I went, I was offered academic scholarships to some of those same colleges that turned me down before. And the sister school for Okaloosa Walton Community College was um, University of West Florida, which is in Pensacola, about an hour away Mm -hmm. from there. And about 10,000 students. I show up on that campus. I'm the only African-American male at all of my classes, man. I never saw a place that looked so white before in my life. (laughs) It was just everywhere I went. But you do have some history of that. I mean, the, the high school you went to 
When, yeah, but it when, wasn't. Pre- it was predominantly white, but right. there was a lot of black people this around. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This but this was. White. I mean, I'm not seeing black people anywhere. I'm there. I was joking around with um with some of our mutual friends. I yeah. said even the white people walk around on campus like, well, why are so many white people here? <laughs> <laughs> so they would wonder why I was so white. That's and we used to. We had a fun. We had a nickname that we used to students of color who went to that school. We all knew each other. Yeah. On, out of ten thousand, we all knew each other. <laughs> on when it came to black students, yeah. and we had a. Um, even in my one of my best friends, he's still one of my best friends today. He's a, a white guy, and he didn't know that we had a nickname for our college. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is UWF, University of West Florida. Students of college used to call it UWF, University of White Folks. Right? <laughs> and my friend Dana, like, I didn't know you called it. And I'm saying, well, we wouldn't see it around you guys. But I graduate there early at the top of my class at age 20. Wow. Was voted student of the year Man. out of 10,000 students on that campus and um, bought my first home. The semester before I graduated from college. So, wh- how how do you how do you how are you earning money at that point? You you work. I was working two or three college. jobs. No, now as far as because people when I taught, I, I lecture at college campuses all over the country, and they want to know the biggest thing they're most shocked by not me graduating top of my class, not graduating early. They're like, "How'd you buy a house before you graduated?" Well, when I was a freshman, well, going I guess I was a sophomore at that time, going to University of West Florida. But my first semester in that college, this is how I got through everything in life when I got out of Miami, I would always go to a person who had the answer and I would ask, how'd you do that? Then they would give me the answer and I literally would do exactly what they told me to do and I'll take action. Okay. So I tell my students, I would ask, get the answer and take action. It, it was as simple as that. So when I was um, coming into University of West Florida, I knew from talking to people who had already graduated, they said, man, if you can do it, guys always ask, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Right. And a lot of them said, man, I would have, would have bought instead of rent. I said, buy, buy what? They said, buy a house. I said, how do you buy houses? And they would try to tell me, but I couldn't understand. So I went to a person who would knew, know better about buying houses than, than anybody, which would be a real estate agent. Yeah. So I go to a real estate agent office at about 18, 19 years old. And I remember Jane Wilcox was her name. I said, Ms. Wilcox, my name is Joe Martin. I'm a broke college student, but I won't always be. Give me about a couple of years and I'll have some money. How can I buy a house? And she starts laughing. I said, I'm serious. She said, you serious? I said, yeah. I said, I want to buy a house. I said, not now, but eventually. And she said, how serious are you? I said, I'll come by here if you teach me how to buy a house. Okay. And I would go by her office and she would um, tell me how to buy, buy, keep your credit up and all this other stuff. And I'm writing all this stuff. And I did exactly what she said. So I ended up buying a foreclosure my senior year. Wow. In college, never rented. Wow. Right. And so that was, so I tell students, I said, it was that simple. I asked her. She gave me an answer. I took action. That yeah. was it. And I've done that with everything. So I graduated there, top of my class. Um, I ended up getting a great job working for um, the federal government doing public relations. My undergrad was in public relations. And I ended up um, starting my first business at 22. I graduated at 20. Mm-hmm. First business at 22. Um, I became the youngest professor ever hired to teach in the state of Florida at the age of 24. Wow. Had my doctorate degree before I was 30. Bought my, um, bought, I moved my mom out of the projects a year after I graduated from college. Got her out of there. Good. Ended up working for the Florida governor's office at the age of 26 as the communications director for his community service division. Ended up writing several books before I was 30 years old. And I just, success after success after success after yeah, success. The same things. When you're going to write that book, you don't know how to write a book. You don't know how to Went to another a author. Book. Hey, how'd you do that? Yeah. Gave me the answer. Took action. When I started my first business, you know, I, I, got, I used to buy my suits from this guy downtown. He was from India. And he can barely speak English. And I'm thinking, this dude owns a business. He's right. like, he's learning, just learning the language. So I said, T, his name was T. I said, T, dude, how'd you do this? He told me how he, him and his family came over to this country and what they did and pulled their money together and they did all this stuff. And he told me, this is how he did. I said, man, I'm thinking about, this. so I did what he told me to do and I started a business. Genius. Yeah. So I, I mean, seriously, you who could. Knew? All you got to do is ask and people will tell you. That's exactly <laughs> right. You do. And, and there's so many experts out there now that, that make themselves available by seminars or, or weekend things or whatever. But, but mostly if you just ask somebody, mm-hmm. they'll tell you, they're they'll happy tell you. to tell you. But the problem is we're not humble enough to ask and say, I don't know. Yeah. And so I was so hungry. I was willing to ask anybody. I didn't care how old you were. I didn't care what color you were. I didn't care what your gender was. If you have something I want, I'm going to ask you how you do that. Right. And so I ended up doing that. And so I was, became, I got married at 22, um, which is a real young age to get married. Yeah. And, even though I achieved all that success, this is now going to the ruin part. So that was, I call it rags because I, by that time I was earning a six digit income when I was in my twenties, man. And I wasn't even an athlete. And, and you're, <laughs> you got your mom up there and she's doing well. Yeah. 
and, and now, now I have place. a son and okay. everything's going great. But the problem was all these people I'm asking, the experts at everything, what I didn't know is how to be a man. See, what I knew how to be a business owner. I knew how to be a, a great uh, a student. I knew how to be a homeowner. I knew how to be a good public relations guy. Um, I knew how to be an author. I knew how to be a speaker. And no idea how to be a man because you know why? Didn't have anybody to ask. Yeah. And you I didn't see have anybody life. to ask, and you had no no real role models no. all growing up. None of your friends. No. Nobody's dad was a part of your life. No. As a matter of fact, I tell you this. Well, I take that back. It was one. I only had one person I knew in my neighborhood who had a mom and dad in the home. Wow. Like a married. Yeah, mom married. And, and they were, and that was a bad marriage. And the mom ran numbers and the dad bootleg videos out of the back of his um, trunk. So that's your, that's your, that's your image of marriage. Right. That's your image of a family. Right. So I didn't see any examples of a great husband, a great father. So who could I ask, how'd you do that? So I can get the, answers and then take Do you the think action. that if you had come across that at that point in your life that you were ready to ask somebody for that? I mean, was that even something that you were looking for? Not anything I was looking for, not even anything I thought I needed, Yeah, but it wasn't available. I mean, to even know that I at needed. this point, you're kind of like, I got this, man. I'm making money. I got my mom up here. We're safe. We're not getting shot at. And then this is kind of Cause uh, I thought I made different. It. I thought, yeah, yeah I yeah, thought you, this is what the American dream is about. But go back, go back to when I was telling you about college. I wasn't even thinking about going to college until I saw somebody do it. Yeah. And they said they were going to do it. What's that? You're going to college? Right. It's not so, even on the radar. So it's not even on the radar. I didn't know I needed college. Right. Until I talked to somebody who was going to college. So I didn't know. And I didn't realize, you know, when I knew I needed this is when I ran into problems in my marriage. Hmm. So here's the, here's the ruined part. Because I didn't handle the pressure well, didn't understand how come this woman's not happy. I'm providing everything for her. She doesn't have to want. For it. She doesn't have to work. And, and you met this woman in college. Um, I met her. Yeah, when I was a fre- okay. well, when I was a freshman at Okaloosa Walton Community okay. College. And so she moved up there with you. No, well, before so- we got married, she went off to another college, but we still were in relationship. Okay. And soon when I proposed, she left that college to come finish oh, okay. at the college I was going gotcha. to. So we were pretty young. And I was already, by the time I got married, I was already graduated. I had a great job and everything. So this is, you know, wow, this is what you look for. You got a man who has a great job, great career. Yeah. He can take care of you. He's, he's a homeowner, all this other stuff. But when it came down to, as we know, if you're married, it's not going to be perfect. And I didn't have anybody to turn to, had anybody to ask. And I thought, man, I don't understand. This woman's just not happy. What's going on? Mm-hmm. So like a lot of men do when, they don't know what to do. They turn to medicate. And men choose a lot of things to medicate. It could be um, sports, working out all the time, yeah. drinking, yeah. drugs. With me, it was women. It was started with porn. And then it got into women to multiple women. And with the access that I had, the money that I had, is just like throwing gasoline on the fire. Now, also go back. Remember, I was sexually abused as a child for three yeah. years. What do you think that did to my identity as a man? Had me questioning it. Yeah. And so with this now, this money and this woman ain't acting right. And what do I need to do? To, what, what's going to make me prove my manhood? Is going to be lifting more weights? You know, is it going to be me drinking? You know, me being a life apart? No, it's going to be me. How many women can I get? Especially when the women started responding like, well, you're doing all that for your wife and she's not happy. Boy, mm. if I was married to you. Mm. And that began the beginning of the end. For a young man, that's, that's oh, hard to... Don't give a young man who has been taught how to be a man. Well, you know this from watching sports. Right. Give him a lot of money yeah. with no male role model and say, okay, now be mature. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. Ask Allen Iverson what he thought. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, ask all these guys you yeah. see that we judge prematurely, not realizing that they didn't have a blueprint or a model for what a man supposed to do. Right. So I thought I was more educated. I'm smarter than that. I go back to my survival mode of what's going to make me feel like a man. So it was women. So I became a serial adulterer. Mm -hmm. And eventually my wife found out and she couldn't handle it. And I don't expect any woman to be able to handle that. So I ruined a 16 year marriage and I lost my wealth. Wow. Lost my integrity. Almost um, lost my health because I'm protected. I could have killed her. I could have killed me and not know it. Wow. Um, So ruined my family. And so here, how do I get, how did I get all that stuff before 30 and lose it all before 40? I realized because I didn't know how to be a man. And what I've been doing my whole life is trying to outrun my past by overcompensating, medicating, isolating, trying to get away and say, I don't need a man. I don't need help. Well, you know what? That's interesting because when I first walked in here, 
we you you just noticed uh, which some people do they see the way i'm built maybe i have a little cauliflower ear and mm -hmm. wow you, you look like a wrestler did you wrestle mm -hmm. and you said you wrestled too yeah <laughs> and um and that's that's something that i've noticed that that so much of the success or any success that i may have acquired at this point can be attributed in some way shape or form to being able to tackle something one on one mm -hmm. i'm not afraid I'm not afraid to get out there one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. I'm not afraid to be out in the spotlight. I'm not afraid to get up and speak in front of people. I'm not mm -hmm. afraid to do all of these things that come from a background of wrestling. Mm -hmm. But what I've found as I've gotten older and more mature is that that attitude is outstanding. That's great. That's confidence. Right. right. That's confidence. That's being able to just say, I can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Wrestling is one of the greatest teachers of that because it's just you and somebody else in front of a bunch of other people. and in sometimes. In the, in the practice room where there is no other people. Right. It's just you and somebody else. Right. And that's when toughness comes out. And that's when, when you know, just your ability to either, it, it's now. You, you're, you're either going to succeed or you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. There's 50-50 chance. So that attitude has been very good and I'm very happy that I have it. But at sometimes as well, it has been a serious detriment, a serious detriment to the fact that now I feel like I can handle anything by myself and I don't mm -hmm. have to ask anybody for anything else. I can, in fact, I don't want to handle any, anybody. I don't want to rely on anybody else. And that's why I think I gravitated towards um, individual sports rather than team. Right. You know, if you're, if you're good at the football team and somebody else clips on the way, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. you, you, all of your effort is for naught. Mm -hmm. So I think I gravitated to that uh, individual sports and I think that stayed with me for a long time in my life. But once I've understood the value of team and the value of reaching out to other people and, and the value of asking for help, man, lots of things transformed for me and the ability to, to build that team and not act like, you know, the Rambo or the wrestler. But I've also seen that wrestler mentality get people in trouble where they, one particular person that I know, his marriage started going bad. All kinds of stuff started happening. And he just wrestler's mentality. That's what he even told me. He said, Man, wrestler's mentality. I dealt with that for three, four years before I reached out for help. And he didn't reach out for help until she was gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That can get you in as much trouble as it can help you, I think. But, but so, so for you, you start reaching out again, right? To, at, at this point in your story? Well, I didn't reach out. I just kind of wallowed in my own misery. Okay. Because I'm looking back on, how did I get here? But you overcame so much. Yeah. And to now be here. And I didn't, and I knew, I said, what's wrong here? What's going on? And so I uh, ended up being um, introduced um, to counseling to help me understand my past and what my root issues were. Did somebody te teach yeah. you that? Did you reach out to somebody and say, how do I get over this? Well, and they let said me, counseling? You know, I'm glad you brought it up because let me back up. Because when I was trying to save my marriage, usually when you're trying to save your marriage, yeah. is I'll do anything. Right. We need to get into counseling. And well, the counseling didn't help our marriage, but I realized I needed it anyway. Oh, okay. And so I stuck with it even after the divorce. And I started understanding where some of my root issues were because it really wasn't, I thought, man, I'm just a porn addict. I'm just a sex addict. No, that's not, that's what I chose to medicate with. Mm. But I was, what, the question is, what was I medicating? And what I realized, I was medicating a lot of deeper issues, fear of abandonment, control issues because my life was so out of control as a kid and I had no control over the results. So I became domineering and had been, like you said, even wrestling, yeah. I wanted to be in control of everything. I wanted success and failure to be on me instead of being dictated by other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, it, so I didn't realize again that I needed, what I really needed was, and we should have known this from being a wrestler, that no champion has ever succeeded without a coach. That's right. Every champion has a coach, even in individual sports. Tiger Woods has a coach. Yeah. Michael Jordan. Had Michael a coach. Jordan had a coach. Many of them. Yeah, actually. And so I needed a coach, but the problem was I didn't, I didn't see any coaches, coaches who were qualified. Mm -hmm. And the co coaches who are usually a coach is older than you, at least has more experience than you. Even if they're not a better athlete, they have more experience and they've had some success in something that they can show you how to get it. Mm -hmm. And so the people who, because I had achieved so much so young, believe it or not, most people were intimidated by me. Because they're thinking, what, that dude makes more money than me. Yeah. He's more educated than I am. He's done more than I am. What can I possibly teach him? Not realizing that doesn't define your manhood. Yeah. I call it the Asians. I said, 
your occupation, education, compensation, and reputation, and your level of intimidation shouldn't define who you are as a man. Mm-hmm. That's how we define it in society. What do you do for a living? Oh, if you do that, that means you must make a lot of money. Where'd you go to school? Man, how many Twitter followers do you have? How many women think you're attractive? How yeah. many women can you get? Wow. And guess what? Do you fear me? Those are the Asians. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we think that's manhood. So imagine me stepping into a room and I need a coach and they're looking at, that dude makes more money than me. He has a most, more pre- pre- prestigious job. He has more degrees than a thermometer. Wow, everybody respects him and fears him. I can't. But what did can I that do happen, him? though? Did you did you reach out to coaches and they're they're kind of giving you the stiff arm or or? No, I didn't reach out because I didn't think I needed one. Right. Um. And I realize now that most men don't realize they need a coach yeah. until I kind of breeze the issue. I always ask them. I said, "Do you want to be a champion?" He when I'm at anything. Every man wants to be a champion at something. Mm-hmm. Husband, father, you know, employee, right? Employer, manager, CEO. Do you want to be? Do you want to be one considered one of the best? And they're in 100% of men say, absolutely. Okay, who's your coach? Huh? What champion has ever succeeded without a coach? Mm-hmm. So if you tell me you want to be the best at something, you don't have a coach, you're delusional. Because Michael Jordan couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And he was the best. Right now, if anybody said who's the best at what they do, they all say Michael Jordan's up there. Yeah. So if you want to be the best at what you do, how can you possibly say you're serious about it if you don't have a coach? And so that's how I get them to even think about Because most men are not walking around thinking they need coaches. So I was the same way. But then when I realized that when I met somebody, that's when, see, it didn't hit me until I met a man who wasn't impressed with all of that. <laughs> see, he wasn't impressed with all the things I had achieved. Matter of fact, he made less money, less educated. Nobody knows. Matter of fact, he's not even on social media today. Him. <laughs> and so, but yet when I was in his environment with him and his wife and his eight kids, and I saw the way they looked at him with the level of respect that I thought only money could buy, that only accomplishment and achievements can get. And I'm thinking, this dude has something that I don't have. Okay, so this guy that you're, how, how do you get, how do you see that? How do you, how do you get around this person? Oh, how did I get to this person? Now, that could be a whole show, but I'll give you, <laughs> I try to give you the brief version of it. I was lecturing at Florida International University in Miami, and I lived in Tallahassee, Florida at the time. I was teaching at Florida a m University. Okay. And I was lecturing there in Miami, and this kid came up to me it was a leadership program for student leaders. And I had written a book on servant leadership. He bought one of my books. He was the last kid in line. And he asked me to sign his book. But when I asked what's his name, he told me his name was Micah. And he, but he told me not to sign it to him. He said, sign it to his dad. And it caused me to pause okay. because I had sold thousands of books and signed thousands of books. Nobody's ever asked me to sign a book for hmm. their dad. So I asked him who his dad was. He told me his dad um, was a teacher in Miami where I'm from. And I said, okay, where does he teach? He t- mentioned, uh, middle school in my old neighborhood in Liberty City. Wow. And I was like, wait a minute. That's, first of all, that's one of the worst middle schools in Miami <laughs> is in Liberty City and you're white. I said, there's no white people in Liberty City. I never saw a white teacher. How can you, I said, are, is your dad white? He said, yeah, my dad's white. Huh. I said, why is he in Liberty City? He said, he chose to, to teach there. I said, what? I said, what does he teach? He said, he's in charge of indoor suspension. I said, this dude is in charge of indoor suspension at the worst middle school in Miami? He says, yeah. And I say, wow. And something told me, Tom, to give that, that kid my card. Okay. I give my card to kids who I think don't have a role model. Yeah. Obviously, this kid is not in need of a role model. He loves his dad. He respects his dad enough to buy him a book that he thought his dad would love on servant leadership. Right. So I give him the card and explain to him I don't usually give it to kids like him, but I've given it to him because I want him to keep in contact with me because I just want to follow his life because he's yeah. already in college, so he's going to be graduating in a couple of years. So, dude, I just want to know. For you to have a father like that, that you respect and admire so much, I can't wait to see how your life turns out. Hmm. He thought it was a weird thing to somebody asking him, some stranger speaker right. asking him to email him and keep in contact with right. him. But he took it to his credit. Micah took it. I go back home. Two weeks later, I get a call from his dad. Hmm. And um, his dad calls me up and asks me about the book and everything. He says, my son told me you're from Liberty City. I said, yeah. He says, and you wrote a book? I said, yeah. He said, yeah. and you're from Liberty City? I said, yeah. He said, then he asked me, he said, how'd you get out? I said, excuse me? He said, how do you get out? And you know what I told him? Definition of manhood that I thought was a man. Education. I could be, he said, shut up. I said, excuse me? He said, I don't want to hear that. See, he was a different type of man. Right. He wasn't intimidated. He says, no, that's not how you got out. I said, yes, it was. He said, no, no. He said, see, I've been teaching at this school for 22 years and I've been to 28 funerals. 
my kids don't make it to high school. I want to know how'd you get out to even get to college, right? To get the education, the conversation. Something happened. Yeah. And I broke down crying on the phone. And he asked me after I told him the truth that barely, by the skin of my teeth, right. he says, What would it take to get you down here to speak to my kids? That's how I met him. I volunteered yeah. to go down to speak to his kids. So that had to be that had to be something right there. You've been out of this place. For a long time, you at don't that time, have about thirteen years. You do not mm-hmm. have good memories of this place, mm-hmm. and now you're volunteering to go back down, to go back for the first time and speak there. Now I've spoken all over Miami before at University of Miami, Miami Dade, FIU, Barry yeah. University, all the colleges in Miami, mm-hmm. and which I never visited when I was a kid. I didn't even know those colleges were there. But to go back to my old neighborhood, and he had he blocked out five days, and I went to sixteen schools. Wow. In five days, I mean, that's, that's and, but, I, but I live, but I live with him for five days in his okay. the, in his family's environment, and it changed my life. Okay, so, well, what does that look like? You go, you go. He picks you up at the airport, or what? And then he picked me up at the airport. Then he takes me to um, he takes me back to Liberty City, and I ask, I say, Mister Miss, you live in Liberty City? He said, No, no, I don't live there. So why are you taking me there? He said, Well, I want to make some rounds, and I want to take you and show you something. I said, Sure. I uh, find out he's an ex wrestling coach. Okay, how ironic is that? Yeah. Right. And matter of fact, I believe we actually probably met and I didn't know who he was when I was a kid. Oh, really? That's the craziest thing about it. Because he, huh. when I wrestled, he mentioned some of the team, the, play, the um, players I, I wrestled. Yeah, yeah. And it was some of the, I'm like, we had to be sitting apart, not knowing our world was going to collide about right. 20 or 30 something years later. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, but he takes me in the neighborhood. He's checking on the kids from his school, from the school. Hey, Mr. Manson, how come I haven't seen you today? He's going around. I was nervous because it was getting dark, you yeah. know, because he's a white dude in this neighborhood. But he, it was like he was so comfortable in the environment. And then I started getting nervous because they were wondering, who's this dude with you, Mr. Mintz? He's all right. You sure? You want to check? Uh-huh. Hey, hey, I'm with the man. <laughs> Leave me alone. Right. <laughs> and so he takes me in front of this house after we check on all the kids and he stops and it's a crack house. And I said, uh, he says, Joe, do you know what this is? I said, yeah, I know what this is. Do you know what this is? And he said, <laughs> He said, yeah. I said, but why are we in front of a crack house, Mr. Mintz? He says, um, oh, I wanted to show you where it happened. I said, well, what happened? Oh, where well, they found my dad's dead body. Wow. I'm like, what? He says, when I was 19 years old, when I came home um, from college, my, my mom told me that my dad was murdered, was carjacked in Carroll City, which is a neighborhood, another hood north of um, Liberty City. Mm-hmm. They found his car there, but his body was found in front of this crack house. Wow. And I said, Mr. Mintz, let me, I said, let me get this right. You've come back to a neighborhood where they murdered your father. He says, yeah. And you're voluntarily working at a school with the worst kids in a community where they took your dad away from you. Why would you do that? And he told me, he says, Joe, don't you see? They took my father because they didn't have one. But I felt if I came back here and I volunteered to become a father, maybe they'll never have to take another one. Wow. And it blew me away. And the only question that popped in my heart was, what kind of man is that? That changed everything. Because I said for the first, what kind of man? Right. See, I had been exposed to males my whole life, but never a real man. Right. And I tell people, I said, that you're a male by birth, but you're a man by choice. So I grew up around a lot of males who never chose to be men. Because they were never taught yeah, how to be. They didn't know. Because I was one of them. You're just the same. You you have no role model, nobody to teach you. There's, there's, there's just like you had so much success just asking people. Mm-hmm. There's nobody to ask. There's nobody to ask. And I equate it to swimming because I said that we're all meant to be lifeguards. And, but the problem is most of us don't know how to swim. And mm-hmm. we're afraid to tell somebody we don't know how to swim. So what do we do? We fake it. Mm-hmm. And we start compensating by, if I can't be a good swimmer, I'll be a good climber. Climbing a corporate ladder. Success, accomplishment, achievement, success, accomplishment, money, women. See, so now you won't ever ask about my swimming, mm. right? Yeah. And then sometimes you have guys like my dad who ran from the responsibility. He was a great runner. Yeah. That's not my responsibility. Hey, I didn't ask for this. Then you have those guys I call fighters when they can't swim. They fight because they're angry all the time and they're bitter at the world. They're blaming everybody. And you got to be on eggshells when you're around them, mm. especially if they're married. Don't bring down, don't, don't say that to your dad because you know how your dad gets. Oh. It can even spill over to domestic right. violence. And so, but the thing is, we're doing all of that so nobody asks us, how's your stroke? Mm-hmm. Do you swim know? Stroke. Yeah, your swim stroke. See, you weren't put here to be a fighter. 
You weren't put here to be a climber or a runner. You were put here to be a lifeguard to protect the position that you've been given by God, the territory, to watch over, be safe and secure, and, and make people in your responsibility more productive. Mm-hmm. They should look to you. They should be able to relax because you're on watch. You're on guard to protect and serve and to give your life if necessary to save them. Right. But the problem is when you start having those problems, like in my marriage and my wife was treading water, how come you're not meeting my emotional needs? Mm-hmm. The kid, one, one of your kids struggling with their sexuality. What you going to, and then we, if we don't know how to get, jump in that water and rescue them, they're going to die. Right. But here's the problem. They're screaming, help me, help me. And what we're doing, but I don't know how to swim. And all this time we had them fooled thinking we could. And we don't even want to ask anybody. We don't want to tell somebody, I don't know how to swim. Right now I'm mentoring a guy who's 83 years old. Today, 83. He's been married for longer than I've been on this earth. And after one of our small group meetings, he came up to me. He said, Joe, will you mentor me? I said, man, you're 83 years old. He said, yeah, but I don't know how to swim. (laughs) I said, but you've been married longer than I've been. He said, Joe, that don't mean anything. He said, I still don't know what I'm doing. And that's when I realized Age doesn't make you mature. It just makes you old. Uh, yeah, exactly right. But he was brave enough and bold enough and humble enough to tell me who's well, young that, enough to be his grandkid that I don't know what I'm doing. Those are very good descriptive words there. I mean, humble mm-hmm. because he's living on this earth for 83 years. Yeah. Why should he ask for help? Mm-hmm. Why right? should he ask for help? Why? Who's going to believe him? Yeah. Who's, and then just, just to your point earlier, he's 83. Why should a coach take him on? Yeah. Right. Like, just like you said, like, and, what can I teach him? Yeah. And I realized I could teach him a lot because he wasn't taught. And when we dig in his past, we realized that his dad didn't teach him how to swim. And that's what the problem is. Our fathers who are meant to be our lifeguards are not teaching their sons how to swim. Yeah. Cause they're too busy climbing, running, fighting. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but obviously that's where you're going is to be the teacher to be the coach, to be mm-hmm. this the lifeguard. person. Yeah. You're the lifeguard of all of these people, but you're teaching lifeguards. Yeah, but you're I'm holding yeah, the lifeguard. lifeguards. Yeah. yeah, lifeguard school. Yeah, is, in a, sense. a lifeguard school. Yeah, and that's, that's the um, redemption part where we are because the, how I got here now with being a, I call it a builder of men. Um, I consider myself a certified professional man builder. I'm a lifeguard trainer, yeah, yeah. basically, is what yeah. it is. How I got here is when Howard, now he's not no longer Mr. Mintz, after I was leaving that day, after he took me back to the airport at the end of five days, I said, and he gave me all these materials to be a better man and all this, because he didn't think he's going to see me again. I said, um, Howard, I know you got eight kids, but would you adopt one more? Mm-hmm. And he's been my spiritual father for the last 15 years. Dude texts me almost every other day. We talk probably at least maybe once Does a month, twice a month. Miami? He's still in, no, he's, in yeah, he's still in Miami. Well, he's not in um, Miami. He's in a uh, place called Miramar. Anybody from South Florida yeah, yeah, knows Miramar, where Miramar right. is. So it's a little bit outside of it. Miami. But um, what's like, oh, I know I was getting ready to tell you that within, it's been a 15 year relationship going on 16 years. But in the middle of that relationship, I'm so thankful because I'm growing leaps and bounds. I'm now remarried. I have custody of my son. Now I have a daughter. Well, you just met my wife today. And so life couldn't get any better. But there's there's still part of me thinking, what if I'd have met him earlier? I could have been retired (laughs) right now. Right. So I'm having this regret about God, why so long to meet Howard? And so one day I'm having this conversation with Howard. I said, I said, Howard, I can't thank you enough for what you've done for me, man. I can't begin to repay you. Oh, by the way, his son Mike is now a professor at UMass. No, Amherst. Right? Yeah. His kids are all doing well. That's good. And, but I'm not surprised. And so I said, Howard, and he says, Joe, it's not for you to ask those kind of questions, man. Just be thankful that we are. And Howard's being nice because after I left his presence, I said, God, I don't get this. I asked you for a man all these years and you never sent me until I was 33 years old. I find Howard. And God revealed to me why. Howard wouldn't tell me. Howard knew the answer, but he wouldn't tell me. Huh. God says, oh, I wanted to, but you were too arrogant to receive him at the time. You wouldn't let, would you so have how does that to message somebody? come to you? Um, just through the, the God revealing to my heart, just ask, because if you ask, arrogant. you know, if you ask, God will reveal to you. And people say, do you hear God? No, I don't hear God with a voice. He speaks to your heart. And they say, how do you know it's God? When it's not something I would say to myself, but it's the truth and it hurts a little bit, <laughs> but I don't feel condemned by it. Mm. See, that other voice that says, you're nothing, you're worthless, that ain't coming from God. It's coming from the enemy. Mm-hmm. But when that word comes to you, it says, hmm, you really want to know the answer to that question? You weren't humble enough to receive it. Let's be honest. You make more money. Would you have been impressed with his credentials? No. Would you have been impressed with 
um, his reputation and all this. I said, no. You would say he's just a. But now that you've been humbled and you've lost what you thought was insignificant, and you realize now that's more important than all this other stuff. Now I got your attention. When the teach when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive. Yeah. You weren't well, ready. That's what I was about to uh point out is that. I mean, you're saying he was in your life before. Yeah. <laughs> but you weren't. That was the radar. You weren't. It wasn't on the radar. You didn't know to look Mm-mm. for. I mean, maybe maybe God puts him right there and says, well, we'll give this a chance to see if this works. <laughs> see and then you're done. like, yeah, I've yeah, got a wrestling yeah. match to go <laughs> right. to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? And then ah, 33 years later or however many years later, here here it is again. Let's try this again. I, I and, remember I heard a comedian say once, he says, um, you know, people say you got to, there's a soulmate for everybody. So he said, I'm concerned. He said, if there's one soulmate for you, what if you gave her the bird in traffic? And when you had a bad day, <laughs> you could have blown your opportunity. <laughs> that could have been it. You know, so, but I believe that God has enough grace and mercy that even if you miss it, he'll give you another chance. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Because you'll be taking that test until you passed it. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what I'm interested in too is that, is there's, um, there's this moment where, where you get these materials, first of all, I'd like to know what those materials were that he's given you and saying, you ought to read this. You ought to, I mean, that's the first step. He, he sees your state and right. he says, right. You need to read this. You need to read this. You need to what listen to that? this. You need to watch this. It, Do you I remember? can't even remember everything that cause it's so much. Right. And it wasn't the fact of what he was giving me. It was why he gave it to me and why he thought I needed it. Yeah. And I never had anybody say, use this. Hmm. This is it, Joe. What you've experienced over the last five days, you see me do pray with my children, do devotionals, have um, um, quiet time. Joe, these family devotions we do, we eat dinner together. Joe, don't look at me and be in awe of me because I was in awe of him. I'm like, yeah. what kind of man is this? Yeah. He said, no, 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 Joe, no. I was taught how to do this. And I'm telling you the best resources that this is the curriculum I use with my kids. This is how I learned to pray for my, my children. This is how I learned to talk to my sons about sex. He had five boys, three girls. Mm. This is how I learned to take my daughters on dates so they understand what a real man is. So he's just, so it really wasn't what he gave. It was the, the yeah. heart that he gave yeah. behind it. And so his intention. He, yeah, it was his intention. Yeah. So he, well, he's teaching me. That's why I tell you the redemption part is about within seven years of conversation. And I said, Howard, I said, um, I know I can't repay you, but if I could do anything for you, man, you name it, I would do it. Cause I can't, I said, my family is reaping the benefits now based on your intentionality. Yeah. What can I do to ever repay you? He said, Joe, just do one thing for me. I said, what's that? And I'm hanging on every word. He says, <laughs> go make disciple. Yeah. Basically he was telling me, go train some lifeguards. Right. Train the life, set up your lifeguard school, get it going. Yeah, and and get that's it what going. you can do and to repay him. That's why I'm here today with Real Men Connect. Yeah. Because, because of the inspiration in his intentionality, I say, what can I do to pay back Howard for what he gave to me? Pay it forward. Right. He don't want anything from me. He don't want anything from me. And he sits back and he's just loving what he's watching. And I know it's got to make him think, wow. Do you, do you ever have him come to, a, to an event? Or now, he's, he's heard group? me speak before. I cannot even get him on my own show. We have the number one podcast <laughs> in the country for Christian men, and I can't get Howard on. Every time I ask Howard, he won't do no, it. No, no, Joe, I don't want to be. Don't put me out there like that. I don't want. He's to the point. He's to a point. His humility makes me mad because I think it's ridiculous sometimes, and yeah. I get on him about it. I said, "Come on, man. He's not even on social media. We won't even get on social media. Well, maybe, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't understand. And he's because not he's not because he's not on social media." <laughs> Maybe he doesn't understand the impact that things like a podcast or things like, you know, a real serious conversation, not a, not a canned, you know, 30 second little, little piece of, you know, this, but where somebody really gets to know him and really gets to understand what he was thinking through this whole thing. I mean, mm-hmm. man, that could be powerful. But, but he, maybe he just doesn't yeah, understand it he because has, he's he not has part of the it. Book. He has he won't be interviewed. Even when he brought me down. I couldn't, I wanted to tell the story how I got down there. He didn't want me telling the story. Hmm. Right now, he'd be mad at me sharing this on the air with you right now. Because he, his thing is he doesn't want attention drawn to him. Right. He wants, like you asked, what did he put? He wants his, he wants to say, get the heart, have the heart. Don't, right. don't, you don't need to know who I am. You don't need to know my name. Right. Do you, what you saw me do. You don't often need to know someone's name. Right. But you do need to know their story. Right. Because the story is, 
is the motivation. The story is the connectiveness between people that go, man, that's me. Mm -hmm. I need to be part of that. That's me. I need help with that. Wow. I'm not like any of that. Ooh, he just said something that Mm -hmm. sounds exactly like me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's the story that, that connects people. And then that, then hearing that story makes people reach out, I think. Now, you know, I'm going to blow you away now. You know what's the most amazing thing about him? Um, I didn't know it until I built a relationship with him. He does this with a lot of other guys. Yeah. I'm probably, if, I, I, in, in all, he would never admit it, but in all honesty, I'm not even his favorite person he's been to. <laughs> I've probably done the most. Yeah. But, because when I talk to him, he's always mentioning these other guys, I not his you. own children. Yeah. These other guys, I'm thinking, he sure spent a lot of time with them. You don't even spend that much time with me like that, you know? <laughs> but so that's what's so amazing that he, and he does it incognito. He just does it under the radar. Yeah. And so I've learned a lot from him and I know he won't be with me forever. And I'm okay because everybody thinks, how is Joe going to respond when Howard goes on to the other side? Yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm right. good. I'm not going to be devastated because I'm taking full advantage of my time with him now. And also he inspired me to go get other guys like him. So now Howard is not my only guy now. Right. I got five other guys like Howard now. Right. And so, because you can never have too many now good when coaches. Now, when you go to find another mentor type relationship, do you look um, just at this overall person and you're like, man, I want to be like him or he's done something that I want to do? It's more so, and this is going to sound crazy, I'm because I don't know many men who do this. You know how I measure a man? No. By the size of a smile on his wife's face. <laughs> So that's good. So the first thing I, like I look that. for is I see him around his wife. If you met my wife today, I, you know, I always when you when I let you in the door and you were walking towards her, I was looking at her, not you. Yeah. Because I want to see the smile on her face yeah. when she sees you. And so my thing is what I look for in a man is his closest relationships, how he is. I see I used to look at what he was doing. Yeah. I used to look at how well he was doing. Now what I see is I look at his relationship. Because you know what the relationship is going to reveal to me? His character. Well, I know that. And, and I, I have the same habit of looking, looking at their closest relationships like that. And that's what I noticed about you. First thing, when we talked on the phone today, first thing you said is I got a sick daughter and I got to get some stuff for her. Mm-hmm. Second, I said, well, do you want to bump this to, to tomorrow? And you said, no, tomorrow's date day yeah, my with wife, my wife. Yeah. So that's off limits. I mean, I just, I could tell from your tone, mm-hmm. no, that's not going to happen. We're not bumping this till tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, okay, this is a man that's got his priorities in check. Like that, those are the two most important things and that's cool. So right away, I'm I just no. And guess what? I learned know. that from my coaches. I yeah. learned that from Howard. And um, it's not that I, I you know, they're, because if they're not smiling, see, I learned this from ruining my first marriage. If they're not smiling, nothing else matters. If it's not about making them happy, but I want them, when I saw Howard's wife for the first time and those kids, they revered him. And I'm thinking, how do you get that? Mm-hmm. They know you when you roll over on the wrong side, well, wake up on the wrong side of the bed. They know you when you sick. They know when you lose it. They, but yet they still look at you that way. That's what I look for. Them. Right. Because if you can win them, you can win anybody. Because here's the great thing about it. If I can win them, I don't care what anybody else thinks. Yeah. And so they're my most important relationships. And then so I look for guys who have that. And I, I meet a guy and I can fall in love with the guy. I say, man, you're great, man. You're awesome. Can I meet your family? <laughs> I just, I, I just, because I think you're great, but I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Until I know what they think of you. Right. Now, it's a little bit easier now in this day and age because you can look at social media. People say, well, social media is not really real life. No, it's more yeah. highlight reels. However, you, what you can tell and they can't fake on social media is them talking about their wife, their kids, and those pictures yeah. of their wife and their kids. See, yeah. you, can't, you can dock a lot of stuff, but guess what you... See, I can't talk about how ministering to men and discipling men and coaching men. And then my wife can get on social media anytime they say, He's a, he's a fake. <laughs> he's lying. <laughs> Don't listen. So I got to be, so my life is public. So even if he's not showing a picture of his wife, if he's talking about it, his wife can debunk that immediately. You see what yeah. I mean? Yeah, she can debunk that. But I also, you know, I got I to gotta admit that I certainly see some people trying a picture. They're painting a picture of their adventurous right. lifestyle. They're painting the picture of this perfect marriage. They're painting the picture of this which can be some of the problem that 
now they painted this picture mm-hmm. on social media. So now everybody believes it and they don't need to reach mm-hmm. out for help. They don't need to talk to a guy right. like you because everybody, he got everybody fooled. Yeah. But he doesn't. You know, one way I've been able to get through that, I was telling the guy I've met before I came here, I created this thing called um, um, a, a spiritual checkup. All right. It's a little different than we get physicals every year. I say you should get a yeah. spiritual checkup. Now, a spiritual checkup isn't just about the spiritual, but it's about your emotional, relational, and spiritual well-being. And I created this, this assessment. If um, your listeners, they go to myspiritualcheckup.com, myspiritualcheckup.com. It takes five minutes to take assessment. It's not going to ask you about how much money you earn. <laughs> it's gonna, and it's not going to even ask you about your wife or your kids. It's going to measure you in five areas and you're going to score yourself. It takes five minutes and it's going to reveal to you where you are spiritually, emotionally, and relationally. And you're going to see what you need. It's no different if you went to a doctor and they say, okay, here's your lab results. Yeah. It's going to get results. Right. You don't get mad. You just say, oh, so that's the area I need to strengthen. Huh. That's very that's interesting. There. And I haven't seen any exception to it. Any man who's strong in those five areas is probably having a great life. Yeah. And now it doesn't mean his life is perfect. It just means his relationships are intact yeah. and that he feels confident. He's feel good about himself and his family is in good shape. He's doing life the right way. Now, it doesn't tell me that he's rich. <laughs> doesn't tell me. You rich, know, is, rich, is, <laughs> rich is not measured right. in money. And, it's, and we're not even measuring physically how his health is, which right. is important, but we're not measuring that. Well, That's why you go to get a physical. Yeah. We're talking about a spiritual yeah. where you look at your relation relationships, you look at your emotional state of being as well as your spiritual component. Well, a lot of people don't look at things like that, don't even pay any attention to it as well as they also don't pay attention to their physical health either. Right. But, you know, I think we ought to be looking for abundance in every area. In every of area of your life. Every Financially area. as well. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Why and not? socially. Yeah. But, but you don't measure, or I don't measure riches with dollars. Mm-hmm. Riches are... Riches is measured in in freedom. Mm-hmm. Riches is mer- measured in um, love and relationships and and just uh, an overall satisfaction with your life and 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 a and a, a real obvious lack of regrets. Mm-hmm. Like if you can live your life without regrets, you're doing pretty good. Could you imagine being in the hospital and um, you only have a limited amount of time to live? And when the last thing you heard somebody say, could you roll up um, a wheelbarrow of my money and let me see how much money I'm going to leave behind? I want to count it yeah, one more time. Yeah, let me count it one more time. <laughs> yeah. you, you want the people who you love, like you hit it on the head, relationships. God built us for relationship, yeah. relational beings. And out of those relationships, all that other stuff, no regrets. Because if I would have died when what I did to my first marriage, dude, ah, talking about regrets, yeah. talking about wasted opportunities. I am so thankful I did not die during that time, that God has given me another chance to redeem myself and redeem the time that I lost. And I'm thankful for it now. And I couldn't, you know, I tell people my life is far from perfect. I struggle like any other guy, but man, I got a team of people around me. I got great guys in my huddle. Mm -hmm. Um, I got some great coaches, got great relationship with my family. And I'm not wanting or hurting for anything because I got so much support. So on this you know, this rebirth almost of, of, of meeting Howard. Mm-hmm. And then you really transformed your life. You went out, you met a new, you met a new girl, you end up getting married, you have another family. Mm-hmm. Are there moments there where you're still, I mean, I don't know about this. It seems harder than I thought it was going to be like, or was it just, that was the road and just off you went down the road. And I hate to say this cause I don't want guys to get the wrong impression. No, it ain't hard. And not saying that it's easy, but I'm saying it's not a struggle because I have support. Right. So, but you didn't though, right? Right after that moment, you had him. Yeah. Well, I thought you were talking about my marriage, like in being in a relationship now. No, no. Life has been easy. Getting there. Oh, getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Getting there. uh, Yeah. I I doubt it all the time. I was thinking to myself, I've I've, I've messed up too bad. Um, And I know a lot of men who feel that way that when you've done such bad, awful things and then you've lost it. You're thinking, I'll never get it back. It'll never happen for me. You, who gets more than one? Think about it. I made it out of the hood to the, quote, pinnacle of my career. And then you lose it. Who gets another chance? Mm-hmm. Athletes die for that opportunity. Right. Say, man, I had it and I blew it. Right. You know, Michael Vick could, would love to go back and look at his life and say, man, what if I didn't do those things to those dogs? Yeah. Where could I have been? 
am I going to be in the Hall of Fame now or am I not going to be in the Hall of Fame? What if I didn't go to jail? You know, and it's those kind of moments. So when I was coming out of it, that's exactly how I felt. I thought to myself that, man, you've, <sighs> but I had to get to how I was able to get through it. I had to get to a point of resolve that I said, you know what? It doesn't matter if I never see that stuff again. I never achieved that again. I never get to experience love again. God is just me and you. Hmm. It's just me and you, and you are enough. Now, I'm telling you the truth. That it, when God became enough, enough for me, that's when I was good. Mm-hmm. And I, I give you a prime example how <laughs> how how would, how much that meant to me. My son, I have I had custody of my son, and I told him I was going to get ready to get married. Right, and his reaction to me. Now he and my wife, they they love each other. They're close. Right, he lives here in town, and um, he says, "Dad, why would you want to get married?" <laughs> That's what he mean. He said, "Dad, your, your life is perfect." <laughs> he said, "Dad, you he said you're happy. You and I get to spend so much time together. We got this house to ourselves. We get to travel all over the world. This is it, Dad. Why would you want to mess this up?" And I understood where he was coming from. <laughs> I said, Kendall, what you see is a man who's successfully single. See, a lot of men are not successfully single. A lot of women are not successfully single. They think they get married is going to make them complete. Uh You know, so he saw me very happy, even though I lost everything. Right. Because now my life, I had a coach in my life now. I got some friends and support, my team, a teammate. And now I'm, I'm getting counsel. Everything is working for me. And even though I don't have a lot, I have enough. Yeah. And I'm good. And I'm saying, I don't care if I ever be married again. I'm good. And, but I told him, he said, but dad, why would you want to get married? I said, because Ken Long, I said, you're too young to understand this now. I said, but there's a difference between being happy, um, being successfully single and happily married. Mm-hmm. I said, Kendall, I know this is going to sound crazy. You think I got it good now? He said, yeah, that is perfect. You're going to mess it up. I said, no, listen <laughs> to me. Yeah, he said, I said, listen to me. I know you don't get it now, but listen, I know it's going to sound crazy. But if you meet the right woman, who's you become can come one with Kendall you ain't seen nothing yet on what I can be right he said oh dad I just I said I know just trust me the key is finding the right woman and when you Kendall when you when it happens I'm gonna ask you what do you think Mm -hmm. now I wish my son was here now to interview him because now he says I get it I get it because he's telling me I thought you were a great dad before but when I got a daughter who's not my biological daughter, he says, Dad, you're more patient. You're more affectionate. You listen better. I thought you were good before. Yeah. Where was this dad? Yeah. And I said, Kendall, and you know why, right? I said, you think that just happened naturally? I said, that woman pulled it out of me. Yeah. The woman and, and the child. Yeah, and the yeah, child. Pulled, it brings out the all best of sudden, in you. You, you, you know, for, for a dedicated husband, that that is a dedicated family man you give yourself to that process and you turn into a different person mm-hmm. you do you grow into it i don't even person. recognize me now man right. <laughs> what, what, you don't recognize you now <laughs> and and people that knew you before don't recognize you now but he definitely I look doesn't. at i look at life before kids and after kids and yeah. first of all i thought i knew what love was mm-hmm. not until i had a kid mm-hmm. you know and then i have two kids and three kids mm-hmm. and you know you, you and the love that you have with your wife and all that, it just, it just exponentially multiplies. And it's, it's, it's really hard to have that conversation with a friend that doesn't have kids because they don't know what you're talking about. They just mm-hmm. don't know. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's been the, the most profound, um, thing that's happened in my life is, is no, he, get, he gets it now and he realizes that he said, dad, I see now the key is finding the right woman. I said, yeah. yes. I said, she doesn't complete me. She compliments me. Right. See, because I said, Kendall, you know, you saw what you thought was great about me. Didn't I have some problems? He said, yeah. I said, but you notice how different we are, but together we're better together than we are separately. Yeah. See, that's what I was trying to get you to understand, that you saw a good product, but you didn't see how the product could be improved if those weaknesses were shored up. Mm -hmm. I said, now you see us together that, guess what? She would tell you the same thing. And my daughter, Faith, like, man, we were good before you brought this dude into the picture. <laughs> and now if you met my daughter, Faith, you would not, you can't convince her that I'm not her biological dad, even though she knows her biological uh-huh. dad. Because to me, to her, this is my father. Yeah. You know, and I will tell you this, and I give a plug for my son, because my son and I, I I'm really hard on my son, because I think he should be 
based on me being his dad. And I know this sounds arrogant. I'm like, dude, you should be the most motivated, driven <laughs> young man. And my, and my son is just figuring out life like any other yeah. kid. But one day he told me he was honest with me. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this on the air with you. But we were watching a movie together of a kid who had grew up in my old neighborhood. Matter of fact, the movie won an Oscar called Moonlight. Okay. And so he said, Dad, how do you feel watching that movie? And I said, it's emotional because it, it, they shot it on site. So I'm looking at my old community. Yeah. Matter of fact, I saw the high school I should have gone to. They didn't bust me because mm-hmm. that's the high school I was supposed to go to. And he says, Dad, I want to say something. But please don't be mad at me. I said, can you know, you can tell me anything, man. Go tell me. He says, I look at you and Tanya, that's my wife. And I say to myself, that could have been mom. We could have been together wow. as a family. I, you know, you, you say, I love time. You know that. But dad, I can't help but think, what if right. my dad would have been this kind of man younger? Where will we be as a family? You're talking about celebrating now over 20 something years of marriage, going on 30 years of marriage. And he said, and I said, Kendall, and I couldn't say anything. I'm saying, Kendall, I'm so sorry, man. And he said, but dad, but then I think if he would have still been with mom, faith wouldn't have you as a dad. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't do that to faith. And I broke down wow. crying, man. He says, dad, I could not imagine you not being in faith's life. That's how close my daughter and I are. Because yeah. he, I remember telling my daughter one day, I said, uh, faith, I said, um, he said, she said, I said, I love the fact that I'm your dad. I said, you notice I don't treat you any differently than Kendall. She says, yes, you do. I said, no, I don't. Feel, I treat you guys all the same. I discipline. He said, Daddy, no, you don't treat us the same. You treat me better. That's what he said. I said, no, I treat you differently. But he said he'd rather me and his mom had gotten divorced than my daughter not having me in her life because her dad wow. abandoned her. How old is he when he's this, telling you this? Last year. <laughs> yeah. Last year. He's 21 so now. Is, how old so he's is 20. 21. Well, that's a lot of wisdom coming and from And every time a, I think he's a knucklehead, he'll say something like that. I'm like, oh, look at you, man. Yeah. I, I broke down <laughs> crying. And I was like, that showed me a lot of maturity on his part. Because I didn't even look at it that way. He said, because he and his sister right. are close. But he says, as much as it kills me that you and mom are not together, I'd rather Faith still have you as a dad. Yeah. Because he sees how much is meant to her. And he wouldn't want to see his sister hurt like that. Man, I said, how cool is that? Man? I said, dude, you, you might get that in heaven cool. for that. <laughs> yeah. So could I extrapolate from that, that you, your lifeguard school, for lack of a better term. Yeah, we call it the Real Man 300. <laughs> the Real Man 300. Yeah. So what, what but, but the other is Real Man Connect. That's, and then that's the my organization. That's the program of the training. <laughs> so the 300, what is it? What's the significance of the 300? What it is, is that it, men, I believe that they need to be strengthened in five areas. When it's, especially, I'm talking about Christian men here, but it can be any man, but five critical areas. And that's what the spiritual checkup will show you. Okay. It's only five areas. You show me a man who's struggling, he's struggling in one of those five areas. So the thing is, the test reveals where you are. And what I realized when I looked at the numbers, 80% of the guys who take that test either are average or below, hmm. which is shocking. What that tells me, 80% of the guys who are taking the test, there's been hundreds of them taking the test, 80, 80% or below. That means 80% of the guys are really holding on, bite knuckling it. Yeah. They're either surviving or they're failing or they're just giving up. Yeah. And so, the te- so imagine a doctor giving you a physical Mm-hmm. And you now realize your blood <laughs> pressure is high, right. but he doesn't give you a prescription. He said, just figure it out. Yeah. And now you know what you got to do right. something about your blood pressure. Don't, don't ask me what you do about your blood pressure. So I realized that we had this test that revealed, and, they, and everybody tell me, it's accurate. They say, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly what's going on with me. But I didn't have a prescription. Right. Now, my organization. Well, what, are, what are the five areas? Oh, the five areas. Um, is one that they have to have, uh, we, we call it Christ, because that's who I believe in, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. But at least I tell them, even if they're not a Christian, something bigger than them. Mm-hmm. Every man must have something bigger than him. Or well, that means he's playing God, and then we're all in trouble. Right. All right? So, but what's his relationship like mm-hmm. with him? Mm-hmm. Then the second thing is connection. That's your teammates. Who's in your huddle? Mm-hmm. How many guys do you have in your huddle who will love you the most when you deserve it the least. Mm-hmm. That one that you could have done the most heinous crime and why everybody turns their back on, on you, even maybe your wife, he ain't going anywhere. Right. So how many guys do you have in your huddle? That's the connection piece. Do you have community? How You're only strong as number of men in your life. Who's on your team? Mm-hmm. Who are all the guys who are going in the same direction you're going for the same, have the same vision 
I'm not talking about your individual goal. You want to be a great husband. You want to be a great father. And you want to do it to God's glory. Mm-hmm. How many guys like that do you have on your team? You know, so we talk about the huddle with the connection, community. Then I say, oh, I want to know who's coaching you. Mm. How many coaches do you have on your team? How qualified are they? Are they men you want to be like and emulate your coaches? And then the last one is, when was the last time you had counseling? Mm. Most guys don't want to go to counseling unless it's court mandated. That's a problem. <laughs> and I asked, I said, when was the last time you went to counseling? I don't know, man. It's been about 10 or 15 years. What if I told you I've been driving around my car for 10 or 15 years, Tom, and I've never got it Take it in for oil change. They do. Are you trying to kill that car? Well, what yeah. are you trying to do to your emotional, relational, spiritual well being if you're not getting a checkup? Yeah. And so to me, I don't call counseling counseling. I say, when the last time you had a tune up? Mm-hmm. You had a tune up. Yeah. And so those areas and measuring those areas, what we've done with the Real Men 300, when they take the test, now we're saying, now you have three options. One, you can ignore the test results. If I got high blood pressure, I can ignore it. Yeah. <sighs> okay. I just wait to die. Maybe I get some good years in. And that's an option. Nobody's mad at you. You can say, you know what, boy, I see some problems. I need to come up with my own regiment to fill these holes. Okay, I need to start recruiting some teammates. I need to start finding some coaches. Man, I need to um, get me, I need to find um, a counselor, a good counselor. Boy, I really need to start getting in my word and start. Re- so you can do that and do it. Do it today. And it could take, yeah. it's going to take some time to get that process going. Or the third option, guess what? We've recruited all that for you. Uh-huh. And if you tap into what we've created in the Real Men 300, we have over 300 people who are either coaches, counselors, te- could be team, potential teammates for you. And here's the thing. I've recruited them like Nick Saban. So I'm building this so you don't have to, you can get there in half the time and not have to wonder, can I trust them? Can I really be vulnerable with them? Can I really tell the truth? So people come to me a lot through our organization, Real Men Connect. Joe, who do you recommend? Who do you refer? Who can you connect with? Now I'm telling you, I say, you know what? I'm going to make it easy for everybody. We're going to create a program yeah. called the Real Men 300 where these are select men who are all trying to do the exact same thing. And we're there to encourage and um, inspire and motivate and hold each other accountable to doing what we know we need to be doing. And so how does this take place online or? or All of what, the above what, is what? online, offline. We have, um, is a lot of it's done virtually online, but they can also do it um, one-on-one with me through coaching. They can do it through email. Uh, we have some groups that we run here in town. Now, obviously they can only do it in town if they're in Chattanooga, but even if they're, we have people right. all over the world, but they can do it virtually on the computer. Like tonight I have a meeting called Real Men Restored, which is part of the 300. These are men who've gone through very traumatic stuff. And they're trying to get their lives back in order, like I did, you know, and uh, some people call them, quote, recovery groups. But and I've been in I was in a recovery group for seven years and I love recovery groups. But there's some things about recovery groups I don't like that you ident- they identify you more with your behavior than your identity. And so when you start taking on the identity of uh, being an addict or being an ex-con or being whatever, even though you may be taking responsibility for it. But now you see yourself as that. And I said, they said, what's the problem with that? I said, because when I stand before God, he's not going to say, hey, ex-sex addict. He's going to say, hey, my child, my beloved. So we're holding each other accountable. How was your week? What was going on? What can you do differently? But remind them of who you are as he sees you, not in your behavior. You're not what you Hmm. do. You're who you are. What you do is just a choice you make. So even though I was probably one of the worst adulterers out there, I'm not going to accept the fact that you're going to call me an adulterer. That's what I used to do. That's what I chose to do, and I paid the price for it. But if you ask me who I am, I'm who God says I am. I'm a beloved child of God who's saved by grace and his mercy, that if he didn't hold me in his right hand, I would fall apart in a heartbeat. That's who I am, and that's what he's going to call me when I see him. So we're, I'm about having a community who all believe that. And if you're not there, we're going to help you grow into that. So I built this team that didn't exist before and say, I'll do the recruiting. I'll be the Nick Saban and get all the coaches we need and get everything. Now, if you want no different than Alabama, you can come, you can join the program or you can try to do your own thing and find another team you want to be a part of. But I spent a lot of time creating this one. Yeah. So how much time have you spent? When did you start building? Three this? years ago. So three years ago, did you have the vision of, of it growing to a, where it is now or no, did it, is no. this it just evolved yeah. it, it evolved and it, i remember when it first hit me 
as I was building all this stuff, launched a podcast, um, over 100 YouTube videos, um, an app that guys can have in their phone, all this to give access to all these free resources, doing blogs and all this other stuff, having a private community. It's still, I had it all, it was all disjointed. I yeah. just thought they need this. Then one day I'm flying back from El Paso after a speaking engagement. God spoke to my heart and said, 300. I said, 300 what? I said, 300 men. That's all you want me to reach? 300 men? I said, 300. I'm like, that's not all. I, I spoke to more than 300 <laughs> men just now. That's nothing. And I didn't get it until I came across a quote when I was on my phone. I was cutting off my phone. And right there on the plane, I'm getting ready to cut off my phone. And I see a quote from um, John Wesley, who was the um, father of the United Methodist Movement. Right. Right. He said, and I quote, if you give me just 300 men who fear nothing but God, hate nothing but sin, and claim to know nothing but Jesus Christ crucified will set the world on fire. Almost dropped my phone. Wow. I'm like, there it is. So you're telling me if I could just find 300 men who desire to be lifeguards the right way, who are not going to be fake like they know how to swim, but want to actually learn how to swim and they want to teach other men how to swim, you mean we'll change the world? He says, yes. So that became my mission statement on Real Men Connect. But here was the problem. Oh, that should be easy. <laughs> you know how hard it is to find 300 men like that? It's almost impossible. But now I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing it. We say, well, you got more than 300 men now. Well, yeah, but they're not really the 300. See, the 300 is going to be the lifeguards that develop out. Right now, we're just teaching everybody how to swim. Yeah. But I was looking for the 300 who want to teach others how to swim. Right. And right now, we're not even close to getting 300. We just got a lot of people who learn how to swim. Yeah. But, but we'll get there. You're making, you're making, <laughs> we're going to get there. You're making some major um, waves in that pool. Yeah. And those waves are going to extend out way beyond that pool in yeah. the ocean and across the whole ocean. And, and that's the way it starts. So, so most of my days are spent recruiting. Yeah. That's what I do when I get up in the morning till I go to bed at night. Is either I'm, giving swimming lessons through stuff we produced already on our website and all the medium that they can get us through the medias and stuff, or I'm looking for potential guys to put in to the 300 hmm. to say, Hey, we need you. You'll be great for the 300. I just, the guy I just talked to today, brought him in today, had lunch with him. Nice. Hey man, come on in. He said, Yo, tell me about the 300. I'm in, nice. you know? So that's what we're doing. That's awesome. Well, I can't tell you how impressed I am with, with your story, not just from, Rags to riches. That's that's a nice story, and you yeah. hear it all the time. But that ruin to redemption. <laughs> yeah, the ruin to redemption is is uh, is quite it's quite the thing. But I mean, you, uh, I mean, I I just want to compliment you on on your your ability to to have this vision and stick to it, and and really devote your life to helping other people in a way that when you help one person, that's helping in a whole community. Yeah. I mean, really, when you touch one person, and mm -hmm. you really you really light a fire under them like a fire was lit under you. Under me, right. That spreads. So, I mean, I know you know this, but mm -hmm. I, it's just one person in a community can make an amazing difference. And when you're doing that all over the world, you are changing the world one person at a time. And uh, man, I, I thank you for it. It's, it's really an amazing story and I really appreciate you telling it to us. Why don't you um, give me all of the ways that people can connect with you and how that looks. Well, I'll give them three, and that'd be the three easiest ways. If they want to see what we do as an organization and all the free stuff we have that's available, just go to realmenconnect.com. That's realmenmenconnect.com. And it's, it'll take you to a portal. And you can go any place you want. There's like 12 different places you can go once you get to the portal. Um, if they're interested in the um, 300 and becoming a 300, because some of them just want the information. They don't really want all the other stuff. They want to be part of all of that. That's cool too. But if they want that and want to check it out, go to Real Men 300. That's realmen300.com. And they will go to find out just about the 300. And I will mention the third thing, which we already mentioned on the air already. If you want to get an assessment of where you are, mm -hmm. because maybe you haven't had a spiritual or physical in a long time, go to My Spiritual Checkup. Dot com. That's my spiritual checkup, all one word, dot com. It takes five minutes and you'll be done and you'll at least get an assessment. Because my thing is, what you don't know is not that it just won't kill you. It, it could destroy you. And sometimes dying is not the worst thing. It's a slow death that could be the worst <laughs> thing. So at least know where you are and where you stand. So you can say, this is where I need help. Or man, 
I'm good. And if you are, and you do really well on that test, please promise me one thing. You'll go teach another person how to swim, how you did that. Because that's what we need to do. If we're good, don't just be good by yourself. Yeah. Help somebody else be good. Right. And so I'm encouraging. And if you need help on how to do that, contact us and we'll let you know. But those three places, I think they'll get everything they need from us. Joe, you're a beast. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. I My appreciate pleasure, your Thanks work and what me, you're man. doing. And I look forward to, uh, to staying in touch. Oh, same here. Really same do. here. Thank you, Joe. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you got something out of that. Got just a little bit of news. We have started a weekly show that is designed to be up to the minute videos of what's happening this week, mostly in the Florida Keys, but also in other places that we fish as well. We'll be putting that out every week. And the best way to find that is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube slash Saltwater Experience. Search Saltwater Experience on YouTube. Subscribe to that channel and you will get updates of when a new video is published. I've also figured out how to put the podcast on YouTube, finally. A lot of people like to put that window behind other things they're working on and listen to the podcast while they are working. So we now have that for you. And there is a playlist called Podcast. There's a playlist called Weekly Show. You can go and see all the new videos that we're putting up there. Started a new email address specifically for this show. And that is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Those emails come directly to me. I'll see every single one of them. So if you have comments, suggestions, ways we can make the show better, and particularly if you have suggestions of someone you would like to see me sit down with in the hunting world, in the fishing world, in the outdoor sports world, or just a motivation, inspirational character, or someone that can teach us all something, I'm very interested in your suggestions. So that's podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can get the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and we're also publishing it on the blog. The weekly show will be published on the blog too, but the best way is to go to YouTube, subscribe there, and you'll get it immediately when it's published. So until next week, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. We'll be right back.